of us, at some point in our lives, will travel through an international airport somewhere in the world. Often, these buildings are glossy, modern constructions where people rush to catch their next flight, grab their bags and head off to see friends and loved ones. But sometimes, airports have hidden secrets, dark tales from the past and travellers and employees who never seem to leave. Some apparitions seem to be tethered to these bustling hubs of transit. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts, sit back and relax, subscribe to the channel and ensure your electronic devices are in flight mode. Today, we'll travel to some more of the most haunted airports in the world. Manchester Airport officially opened on the 25th of June 1938 and initially it was known as Ringway Airport, named after a small parish nearby. In World War II this became a station for the Royal Air Force and from June 1940 this became the wartime base for Number 1 Parachute Training School RAF which was responsible for the initial training of over 60,000 Allied paratroopers. Wartime engineering took place here, with over 4,400 warplanes being built by Ferry Aviation and Avro. After the war, the airport gradually expanded and reverted to a civilian airport. By the 1960s, Manchester was Britain's second busiest airport after London Heathrow. From its early days of operation, there were various reports from both travellers and employees of unexplained phenomena and the presence of apparitions both inside the terminals and outside of the building. One of the airport's most famous ghosts seems to stem back to the days of the Second World War. Since the 1970s, staff and visitors have reported the phantom of a man wearing an RAF flight suit in the area that is today Terminal 3. He is seen wandering around the terminal, looking somewhat confused, as if something shocking has happened to him. Concerned travellers try to approach him, but he stares at them with a look of pain upon his face and fades away completely. Who is this man and what happened to him? to cause such a look of anguish. Could he have been a member of number 253 squadron based here that took part in the Battle of Britain? Was he shot down while engaging the enemy in airborne combat or could he be someone else entirely? Is this the same figure of an airline pilot that's been known to cause trouble in the men's toilets near Terminal 2? This apparition might be described as rude and abrupt. He's been known to follow men into the bathroom and hammer his fists on the door of the cubicle, shouting for the unsuspecting traveller to hurry up. When the startled occupant opens the door to confront the man, there's no sign of another person. On the 22nd of February 1954, a single-seater de Havilland Venom jet fighter disintegrated in the air near Cheadle in Staffordshire. The plane had taken off from Ringway, lost radio contact shortly afterwards, hurtled over two villages and then crashed onto Caverswall Common. The test pilot, Mr Kenneth Forbes, aged 33, and who was employed at Ringway by Ferry Aviation Company, was killed in the accident. Investigators discovered the crash had made a crater 30 feet across and 15 feet deep. 
they found pieces of parachute and fragments of wreckage over a radius of three quarters of a mile. According to reports, no single piece of wreckage larger than a dinner plate was found. Could the tragic apparition of test pilot Kenneth Forbes be returning to Manchester Airport? In May 1939, Ringway Airport hosted the Empire Air Day, a display show which proved to be very popular. A Westland Lysander plane from No. 26 Squadron RAF had been in the air for only a few moments and the pilot was demonstrating how slowly the aircraft could fly over some open ground adjoining the airport. The plane fell into a bad slip and crashed, seriously injuring the pilot and his observer, the only occupants, who were taken to Withington Hospital and later died. Fortunately, the incident happened away from spectators, who sadly witnessed this terrible event. In 1971, airport management received a letter from a man who worked for Claridge Freight Forwarding Company at Manchester Airport. He had decided to terminate his employment with immediate effect. The former employee explained that he was terrified one night at work after witnessing the apparition of an elderly man in an airport security uniform. He explained that he had tried talking to the man but he simply disappeared before him. The incident was so frightening, he could not be persuaded to return to his role. A cleaner reported seeing the apparition in a storeroom, walking through offices and gliding along a corridor. Strange noises, screams, footsteps and the movement of office supplies have also been encountered. Eventually, the airport managers were so concerned that an intruder was on the premises, the police were called. One of the police officers claimed to see the phantom man at the same time as a lorry driver. This apparition is nicknamed the Night Watchman. It is thought he was a security guard who died of a heart attack whilst working his shift in 1968. Sadly, Manchester Airport has had a number of incidents over its long history. In March 1957, a British European Airways Flight 411, coming in from Amsterdam, crashed into houses in Shadow Moss Road on its approach to the runway. All 20 on board died in the crash, as did a mother and her baby, who were the occupants in the house. The crash investigators found the probable cause of the crash was metal fatigue at the bottom bolt, securing the starboard wing number two flap unit. Another crash took place in June 1967 when a British Midland International flight inbound from Palma crashed near the centre of Stockport after a loss of engine power due to fuel problems. Of the 84 people on board, 72 were killed and sadly, in August 1985, the engine of a Boeing 737-236 operated by British Air Tours failed on the runway and fire spread into the cabin. 55 people on board lost their lives, many through smoke inhalation. Although these incidents are incredibly sad, Manchester Airport does not seem to be haunted by any lost souls from these tragic events. Located roughly four and a half miles south of downtown Newark and nine miles west-southwest of Manhattan in New York City, Newark Liberty International Airport is a significant gateway to Europe, South America, Asia and Oceania. Its history stretches back to the 1920s when Newark was the site of two airfields that were used by the United States Air Mail Service. In 1927, Thomas Raymond, the mayor of Newark, ordered plans for a new airport. Construction began in April 1928 and Newark Metropolitan Airport 
opened in October of the same year. The magnificent Art Deco Administration Building was built in 1934 and dedicated by Amelia Earhart in 1935. The airport has been visited by millions of passengers and has witnessed some important historical events. In August 1932, Amelia Earhart completed the first non-stop transcontinental flight by a woman, also setting a new long-distance record when she flew from Los Angeles to Newark in just over 19 hours. Both Charles Lindbergh and Wiley Post, pioneers in aviation, flew planes in and out of Newark many times. Newark's ghostly figures are rather nocturnal in nature. The most famous is the figure of a man in a pilot's uniform and he's been witnessed by staff on the night shift in the oldest parts of the airport, the beautiful 1930s Art Deco building. Witnesses have described him as being roughly 30 years old, a good-looking man dressed in the style of the 1940s with a leather bomber jacket and a cap which carries an airline insignia that nobody seems to recognise. He doesn't speak to anyone who sees him, doesn't make eye contact or engage, and simply walks through the empty building. Perhaps it's a place he knew well. It's as though he's lost in time, but when people do approach him, he disappears and leaves behind a tremendously icy cold spot. Records show that during World War II, the site was closed to commercial aviation and that it was taken over by the United States Army for logistics. It seems Newark might be home to a resident poltergeist, in addition to various apparitions. Lights flicker when they shouldn't, doors open and slam shut by themselves, people have reported being followed by ghostly footsteps when there's nobody there. Baggage handlers have felt an unseen hand on their shoulders and sense a person is stood directly behind them. Passengers have heard whispering voices in their ears and some have claimed to see the spectral pilot. The North Terminal, which operated between 1953 and 1997, was said to be home to an apparition of a woman who would be seen in the daytime as well as in the evening. She was said to be in her early 20s and wore clothing typical of the 1950s fashions. She would sit by herself, gazing intently at what might have been an information board, even when no flights were scheduled at that time. When people saw her, they felt a terrible sense of melancholy and some people would find themselves crying for no reason. The silent lady would stare, looking sad, but who she was nobody knew. In 1997, the North Terminal was closed and demolished to make way for new cargo facilities. Does she wait for the return of a loved one to meet her? Was she waiting for a passenger on one of three aircraft lost in crashes linked to Newark and the city of Elizabeth in the space of two months. On December the 16th, 1951, a Miami Airlines aircraft crashed in the city of Elizabeth shortly after it departed Newark. Flames were observed coming from the underside of the right engine. The plane lurched to the left and the aircraft's wingtip clipped the gabled roof of a brick storage building. The plane came down on the banks of the Elizabeth River, where the fuel ignited immediately on impact. All 56 people on board were killed, and at the time, it was the second deadliest aviation accident on US soil behind Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 2501. On the 23rd of June, 1950, this daily transcontinental flight between New York City and Seattle disappeared. The flight was carrying 55 passengers and three crew members, but none survived. Considerable debris, upholstery 
and human remains were found floating in Lake Michigan. On January the 22nd, 1952, just over a month since the Miami Airlines crash, American Airlines Flight 6780 crashed on its final approach to runway 6 at Newark. This twin propeller plane was flying the Buffalo Rochester Syracuse Newark route. It crashed into a house and burst into flames at the intersection of Williamson and South Street in the city of Elizabeth. The cause of the crash was not determined. All 23 on board were killed, as well as seven ground fatalities. National Airlines Flight 101 became the third unlucky crash in Elizabeth in just two months. The flight, scheduled to Miami, Florida, on February 11, 1952, took off, but was observed by staff in the control tower, suddenly losing altitude, whilst veering to the right. After two minutes, the plane clipped an apartment building, setting the property on fire and crashing to the ground. The plane went up in flames near the intersection of Scotland Road and Westminster Avenue. Of the 63 people on board, 29 died and four residents in the apartment lost their lives. Actress Mildred Joanne Smith suffered severe injuries, including a broken back, broken ribs and burns, but survived. Opened in 1931, Madrid Barajas Airport is the main international airport serving Madrid in Spain. In physical size, it is the second largest airport in Europe, behind Charles de Gaulle in Paris. In 2019, over 61 million passengers travel through the airport, making it Europe's fifth busiest airport. There seems to be one passenger who never leaves. She's been seen by many travellers, members of staff and aviation crews. She is known as the woman in white and she's been haunting since the 1960s. As the airport expanded to cope with Spain's growing tourist industry, the woman dressed entirely in white with a sad mournful look on her face began to be seen in Terminal 1. Initially, she was only witnessed at the departure gates late at night but as time has progressed, she has been seen throughout the day and in multiple locations. She doesn't appear as a solid apparition. She has been described as in her mid-thirties, slim, with long dark wavy hair. She has a beautiful but sad face and seems to be looking for someone, her dark eyes looking past visitors with desperate longing for a mysterious person to arrive. She was seen in December 1984 by a cleaner who was working a night shift inside Terminal 1. The figure was stood at gate 16, staring out of the window onto the tarmac, her hands gently placed on the glass itself. The cleaner approached her to see if she needed assistance, but she simply vanished into thin air. The cleaner was left stunned and terrified. Two years later, she was spotted in the same location, gazing out of the window by a pilot and members of the crew as the plane approached gate 16 late at night. At that time, the terminal should have been empty of passengers. As the pilot left the cockpit, he looked back up at the window where she had been stood, but there was nobody there. Other pilots have claimed to see her on the runway and have reported it to airport security in fear of the woman's safety. When checks are made, there's nobody to be seen. This affected one pilot so much, he went from being a complete sceptic to an absolute believer as a result of this encounter. Strange things seem to occur at gate 16. Passengers report the mysterious smell of old-fashioned perfume, cold spots, static shocks and electrical equipment draining for no obvious reason. Travellers have felt very unwell at the gate and overcome by nausea and headaches. Some speculate that the airport may be built on a ley line 
and that the airport acts as a portal for paranormal activity. Despite hours of research and an array of paranormal investigations, nobody knows who the woman in white is. Local legend suggests it's a symbol of good luck to see her. Was she due to travel, but met an untimely death at a young age? Does she wait longingly for a loved one to return to Madrid? She remains an unidentified enigma. Sydney Kingsford Smith Airport is located roughly five miles from the centre of Sydney in the suburb of Mascot. It is the main airport for Sydney and the primary hub for Qantas. Named after Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, an Australian aviation pioneer who piloted the first Trans-Pacific flight from Oakland, California to Brisbane in Australia. Flights have been taking off from the fields here since the early 20th century. By 1949, the airport had three runways and in 1970, a new terminal was opened and the first Boeing 747s started to arrive. An extremely busy airport that serves millions of passengers each year. It is no surprise it's reputedly haunted by one rather unsettling apparition. The ghostly activity here is centred around Hangar 85, quite distant from the main terminals and structures. During World War II, the airport was involved in a number of wartime operations. Whilst Kingsford Smith was not officially utilised as a military airport, it became important for building combat aircraft and training staff on the ground. The College of Civil Aviation was established here in 1939 to train riggers, fitters, flight engineers and other roles that were vital during the war. But it seems one student at the college refuses to leave. Not long after the war ended, staff began to whisper tales of odd events in Hangar 85. A man, dressed in what appears to be overalls or a jumpsuit, is seen in the vicinity very late at night or in the early hours of the morning. He is a rather unpleasant character and some describe him looking angry and suspicious. For some reason, he seems trapped in this place. Some believe he doesn't like outsiders entering his hangar. Staff who have encountered this eerie fellow speak of icy cold spots and feelings of sadness and frustration and the unmistakable feeling of being watched. Staff have reported being hit by projectiles, including stones, buttons and pens. Several members of staff have seen him inside a decommissioned aircraft's cockpit, looking at the runway longingly and intensely. He appears solid and many think he's a living person, but they are shocked to see him vanish in front of them. Could he be a victim of an RAF crash that occurred here on the 19th of July, 1945? An aircraft bound for Manus Island struggled to gain altitude after takeoff, only climbing to around 40 feet. The pilot tried to avoid power lines, struck a pine tree near a polo ground and crashed into a viaduct north of Brighton Le Sands. All 12 passengers and crew on board died when the aircraft exploded on impact. The explosion was heard four miles away and the flames were recorded as 60 feet high. All on board were service personnel, five from the RAF, six from the Royal Navy and one from the Royal New Zealand Air Force. They were all buried at the Sydney War Cemetery at Rookwood. Is this the apparition of a pilot who lost his life prematurely in the terrible days of the war? Was he a recruit learning his skills to help the war effort who believes the hangar is his domain? Nobody knows his identity, but his presence is a reminder of the airport's important wartime contribution. 
A curious and unfortunate incident happened at Sydney Airport in February 1970. Amateur photographer John Gilpin was developing some photographs he'd taken at the airport the previous week. One of the pictures captured something shocking, something he hadn't noticed at the time. A print with the grainy figure of a boy falling feet first from a Japan Airlines aircraft as it took off. It was the last photograph taken of 14-year-old Keith Sapsford alive. Keith Sapsford was 14 years old and from Sydney. He had an incessant desire for adventure and had just returned from a trip abroad with his parents. The trip was designed to satisfy his curiosity to travel, but ironically, it simply ignited Keith's desire to travel even more. Keith was struggling at home and his desperate parents had recently enrolled him in a school for young people with behaviour problems, now named the Dunley Centre. But within two weeks, Keith had run away and got by sleeping rough on the streets of Sydney. Many weeks before Keith stepped onto the tarmac, his father had told him the cautionary story of a Spanish boy who had climbed into the wheel well of a plane and had fallen to his death. This was meant to be a deterrent, but it had the opposite effect. On February the 22nd, 1970, Keith Sapsford snuck onto the tarmac through the perimeter fence, made it unseen to a Japan Airlines Douglas DC-8 aircraft and made the fateful decision to climb into the wheel well. A few hours later, the plane departed with Sapsford concealed in the compartment. Takeoff happened on schedule, but when the plane reopened its wheel compartment to retract its wheels, Sapsford's fate was sealed. He fell roughly 200 feet to his death. Keith's father, Mr Charles Sapsford, said, All my son wanted to do was see the world. He had itchy feet. His determination to see how the rest of the world lives has cost him his life. After his death, the aircraft was inspected. Evidence of handprints, footprints and fibres from Keith's clothes were discovered inside the wheel well. Had Keith not have fallen to his death, he could have been crushed by the retracting wheels or likely frozen or suffocated to death. Whilst this is not a ghost story as we know it, this photograph that just happens to capture this tragic incident remains a chilling and haunting reminder that Keith Sapsford lost his life in a desperate attempt to seek adventure and run away from the school system. Daniel K. Inouye International Airport is the main and largest airport in Hawaii. The airport takes its name after Hawaiian Senator and Medal of Honor recipient Daniel Inouye, and it opened in March 1929. Initially, the airport was named John Rogers Airport after a World War I officer who served in the United States Navy and was a pioneering aviator. The US military took over the airport after the attacks on Pearl Harbor and the airport became known as Naval Air Station Honolulu. The Navy built a control tower and added more structures, including a terminal, expanded and added more runways, and it became one of the largest airports in the United States at that time. You wouldn't think that a modern structure in a tropical paradise is the normal haunting ground for a ghost, but you'd be wrong. The terminal is said to be haunted by at least two ghosts. The first is nicknamed the Lady in Waiting, and she is seen throughout the building. She is described as tall, slim, dressed in white and with long blonde hair. Sometimes she stands at the gates at night, peering out at the runway. Other times she is seen walking through the terminal with a terrified look on her face. 
she has been seen in restricted areas that are out of bounds to travellers. There are two stories connected to this apparition, but both have the same tragic end. The first is that this lady fell in love with a handsome man who promised to marry her. For reasons unknown, he changed his mind, and rather than ending the relationship in an honest way, he decided to jump on a plane, head off abroad, and never come back. Some believe she is waiting for him to return. Others say, when she discovered his cowardly act, she made the decision to extinguish her life. Another version of the story is that she was engaged to a military man who died in a crash when he took the place of another person. Sadly, there was an incident that could be related to this story, which goes back to March 22nd, 1955. A United States Navy flight was carrying Air Force, Army and Navy personnel from Tokyo to Fairfield Travis Air Force Base, in California. The plane made a stop at Hickam Air Force Base that neighbours and shares facilities with Honolulu International. After takeoff, the aircraft suffered radio problems and the crew decided to turn and go back to Hickam. An error in the navigation caused the plane to stray off course and towards the Waianae mountain range. The plane flew into the mountains, killing all 66 people on board, including the wife and three-year-old daughter of one of the military passengers. The explosion was so loud, witnesses heard it five miles away, and it remains the worst air disaster in Hawaii's history. Is it possible the lady-in-waiting's fiancé was on board this tragic flight? Another, more sinister presence shares the terminal with the lady-in-waiting. Poltergeist activity has been experienced many times in the toilets, particularly in Terminal 1. Toilets have been known to flush by themselves. Toilet paper and hand towels are found strewn across the floor. Toilet seats slam down and taps and hand dryers seem to operate by themselves. Is this mischievous presence also known as the choking ghost? Passengers in the terminal have reported feeling unwell after experiencing what can only be described as invisible hands pressing on their throat and chest. This alarming ordeal has caused some to faint and for first aiders to be called. I have been to Hawaii four times now. I absolutely love it. It's a very beautiful place and from the UK it's a really long long way to go and you get terrible jet lag coming home but it is so scenic and it's so different to the UK. It's lovely and warm, the beaches are fantastic, the wildlife, the turtles are fantastic. It has just the most vibrant colours everywhere. The last time I went to Hawaii was in 2016. Each time I've always stayed on Oahu but I'd like to travel to some of the other islands in the future. And when I was there, I was there to go scuba diving in particular. I did try my hand at surfing. I was not terribly good. I do know I've got some viewers in Hawaii, so I'd like to say aloha to you if you are in Hawaii, or as they say in Hawaii, Hawaii. And mahalo, thank you for watching, and uh, thank you for subscribing. The last time I was in Honolulu International Airport was in March 2016 and I definitely heard toilets flushing on their own in the toilets near the gate but I really just thought it was a leaky toilet. I was flying to Los Angeles and I'm sure like many of us before you fly you keep going to the loo and half the time you don't even need to but you do just to be on the safe side and the only thing that happened to me there that was a little bit odd was as follows and I'm not saying that this is necessarily paranormal and there's probably a perfectly logical explanation, but I do remember thinking this was a little bit odd. The toilets were the metal cubicle type stalls that you get in a lot of airports, and they're the ones where you can see the people's legs, sorry, the ones where you can see clearly the legs of somebody in the loo. And I think there were five or maybe six cubicles at that moment and I was the only person in there because we were already lining up to get on the plane. 
So I was in the first cubicle, which is the one nearest the entrance door. And I was getting my bag and my coat and all of the things ready to go. And I heard the entrance door open and somebody walked past all the sinks and went to the end cubicle and I heard them shut the door. I didn't think anything of it and I came out and I washed my hands, dried them and then from the sink area and just to make sure I bent down a little bit and just checked the floor of the cubicle I'd been in that I hadn't left anything. And (laughs) I noticed that there were no legs in the cubicle that I had heard somebody go in and that the door was still shut. Now the doors naturally sort of hang slightly open but I remember thinking I didn't hear them leave I didn't, but I definitely heard them come in, but there was no bag in there, there was no legs, there were no shoes, there was nothing, but I didn't hear them use the loo, I didn't hear any breathing or anything like that, didn't see anybody, so I don't know, could they have come in and gone back out very quickly? I suppose so, but I still found it a little bit weird that somebody must have come in and then vanished, I don't know, but that's the only odd thing that happened to me, and there's probably a good logical explanation. I just don't have it. There's one other ghost story linked to Honolulu Airport, which is that the Wiki Wiki shuttle bus that runs between the terminals sometimes has a phantom passenger. People have said that they've nodded off on the bus and been woken up by this phantom figure, but some people believe that this person is someone who died on board the shuttle bus many years ago. I've never experienced the wiki wiki shuttle bus ghost. Maybe next time I'm there, I will. I'd far rather meet the wiki wiki ghost than the choking ghost, who sounds absolutely horrible. Good grief. I hope that you enjoyed this look at some more haunted airports. There is a part one that I released in August last year and I'll leave a link to that in the description box below. Lots of people really enjoyed that video because it covered all sorts of different airports in different places. And there's also a aviation archive video that I made which includes a first class British Airways menu from Dallas Fort Worth to London and it's also got some Concorde bits and pieces there's a letter from a Concorde pilot in there there are some other airmails some postcards all sorts of little things to do with aviation if we just go back to Manchester Airport for a moment there is the story that a procession of Roman soldiers in full battle gear have been seen marching near the airport. Now apparently the figures appear to be so real that on one occasion planes were not allowed to land or take off until it was determined that the figures were actually not there. I've struggled to find anything on this but there are reports of Roman soldiers marching along the M6 motorway which is a bit further away from the airport. Now we do know that Manchester was an an important settlement for the Romans but, and there were several Roman roads in Manchester, but the Romans on the M6 have been seen in the Midlands and there was a witness called Sue Cowley who was from Warwickshire and she said she had seen about 20 Roman soldiers and she described them as more like upright shadows than men walking through the tarmac as you would through water. Whether or not the ghosts of Roman soldiers parade around Manchester airport, I do not know. I've got some airline menus for you to have a look at today and a couple of postcards that are from some lovely sunny places and it's really cold here in the UK at the moment so we'll just have to dream of summer. First menu that I have for you is from 1985 and it's a British Airways menu on flights from London Heathrow to the USA and Canada and this was the equivalent of business class from what I understand. The cover definitely says 1980s to me Then, if we have a look inside, we can see that we've got a pretty standard bar service there. And then we've got the menu written in French, maybe in an effort to sound glamorous. Maybe it's to do with Nouvelle Cuisine, or maybe it's just to make the menu sound less British, I suppose. Smoked salmon. Veal. I don't know whether you'd get veal on the menu these days. I don't think they really would. 
or you can have chicken with noodles and then fruit for dessert. I don't know, I would have thought they would have done something a little bit more glamorous than, you know, like some sort of pudding, some sort of gatto or something, because the way they've described it, let's all be honest, that's a fruit salad, isn't it? And then there's cheeses. Well, I wonder if they've got any camembert lurking in there. If you know, you know, and that's all I'll say on that one. And then you can have your afternoon tea with cheese and tomato sandwiches, beef rolls, and look, a radish rose. You don't see those very much these days. They seem to be a lost art, lost in the 80s, I think. And the next menu I have is from the early 1970s, and it's from BOAC, and it was a flight from London to Sydney in Australia. I found the flight times in this book look really interesting, and I think they used to call this the kangaroo route, where you had to take a number of flights to cover the distance. I don't know how much waiting around you would have had to have done in the various airports, but compared to today's air travel, it sort of seems very strange. You know, today you can jump on a plane at Heathrow, stop in Dubai, and be on your way pretty quickly, and it shows what advances there's been, really, in air travel. Let's have a look at the bar tariff. Well, it's got to be post-71 with those prices in pence. No free drinks here, I'm afraid. Beers, 15p. Champagne, 50p. Gosh, push, push the boat out. I think the sort of soft drinks would be included, but you, you're going to need to take plenty of cash with you. It's going to be a long flight. I'll show you the dinner menu from Singapore to Perth. Seafood starter. Sounds quite, quite decent. Again, it's all written in French. All very glamorous. Braised ducklings with lotus seeds. Don't think I've ever had lotus seeds. Gatto with oriental fruits. Now that sounds a bit more like it to me than a fruit salad. And then cheese. Well, you know, the less said about the cheese, the better. And then we've got the breakfast menu from Perth to Sydney. Not sure kidneys would be terribly popular these days, but, you know, the menu reflects its time. I hope you enjoyed looking at those two menus. Let's have a look at some postcards from some warmer climates. And the first one is from Sydney in Australia. And it says, Dear Jean and Colin, Having a lovely time, though the weather has not been what you would expect. Lots of thunderstorms, but it can only get better. Had a wonderful party to celebrate tra Tracy's 50th. Hope you recognise some of the views on the card, though your visit was quite fleeting. My new grandson is doing well. His vocabulary is limited, but can certainly make you understand what he wants. Hope all is well with you and yours, Love Mavis. So quite a modern postcard there. There's a website on the back, so I doubt it's terribly old. The next postcard is from Hawaii. It's from Hanama Bay, which is on Oahu. And this picture just takes me back. I've been swimming in that beach and um, in the sea there, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Dear Joy, this is the life beautiful beaches, fresh fruit off the trees, guavas, etc. And some beautiful walks to waterfalls across volcanic areas, etc. Thanks for all you did on the 11th. Love, Sue and George. This postcard, I saw it, it's from 1992 and it just takes me back to Hawaii. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and have you ever had any ghostly experiences in any airports? Let me know in the comments section below. Please remember to like and subscribe and thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next video. Take care guys.